Hello, everyone. This is Michael Hoffman, um, and we're going to get started uh, with our webinar today on serial storytelling. Um, I am here uh, with Mike Lee, uh, who will uh, um, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, and uh, we are here with C3 Communications, based in Chicago. Um, if you're joining us from the U.S., thanks for joining us early. If you're joining us from the UK, good afternoon, uh, or, or from, from elsewhere this afternoon. Uh, and we're excited to be here because this issue, the issue of serial storytelling, is really critical for nonprofit organizations and those doing social good today. Um, most of the video that we see out there in the world uh, for, from nonprofits are these are one-off uh, one videos that don't connect to anything else. Um, but we're seeing that serial stories are what, what are attracting people and attracting attention. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So a little bit about me. Uh, I was a nonprofit fundraiser and a political consultant. Uh, I then spent several years starting Internet startups and learning about how the web was changing things and focused a lot on video because we've seen uh, an explosion of video on the web and seen how much video content has become important. Um, and I was a founder of C3 Communications really to bring together this belief in the power of video stories and social causes that could benefit from them. And at C3, we, we basically have three areas of our work. We uh, produce video as well as consult for others around uh, what to produce and strategy around video. Uh, we have a web design and development team, so how do these uh, campaigns and information get out in front of people? And then online engagement, which is really about how do you take good content that you might develop and get it in front of the people who can make a difference for your cause. So I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Mike um, and let Mike uh, introduce himself. Thank you very much. And first, let me say what an honor it is to be asked by Michael Hoffman and the team at C3.com to join in and share my ideas. A bit about me, I was a CBS Middle East correspondent in the mid-70s and for 26 years an ABC News global correspondent. I have pioneered the ABC News model for one-person video journalism by traveling the world with a small video camera to find and report on people and remote cultures who, it turns out, share many of our own values. And of, of course, I worked with a large camera team and network production teams as well. One of the reasons I founded Mike Lee Video Storytelling is to help nonprofits tell their stories. My focus for nonprofits is consulting on and producing real life serial storytelling videos. Now, that is stories told in episodes so that viewers keep coming back to your website for more information. These are real life adventures in which good fights bad. The viewer, the viewer, who is hopefully also a donor, is the main hero of your stories here. And I help nonprofits to embed viral triggers in their videos. Now, viral trigger is something about a video that convinces viewers to hit the share button, to spread that story to others on the web. In a few moments, I'll be putting all this together and going through step by step the process of building an actual serial story episode. I know that an increasing number of you are already focusing on serial storytelling, and I expect that we'll be seeing a lot more great storytelling on your websites. It's a very positive development, and I hope to be able to pay part of that growth alongside you. Michael. Thanks, Mike. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, what this serial storytelling is and how uh, storytelling using video like this can increase the support for your organization. Um, talking about tactics and tips to make this work, um, and a little bit about how we can work uh, with, with your cause. And at the end, uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers. If you have a question during the webinar, please type it in to the chat window that you have in your, in your GoToWebinar GoToWebinar software there. 
and we will then uh, put those in a queue and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to address them. If we run out of time, then I will make sure that uh, Mike and I are able to follow up with you individually. Okay, so as I said before, for nonprofits, for NGOs, effective storytelling is crucial. People um, organize their thinking and their beliefs and the things that they care about through stories, even if they can't always articulate that. And so stories of change, stories of individuals make a difference for how people support our causes. One of the things we know a lot from behavioral research, for example, is that when we talk about big issues, when we talk about big problems in the world, people often tune out of those problems. But when we bring it down to a human level, um, we can have real impact. People, uh, it becomes a scale that individuals can relate to, and then those individuals can act. So uh, they identify with those stories, and that moves people to action. So I want to just talk for a quick minute about why video matters, because um, we're talking a lot about these video stories, and video is not always the least expensive way to tell stories, right? It's less expensive to write a blog post or uh, take a picture of something. Uh, but video really matters, and it really is worth the investment, and I want to tell you why that is. If, if we look at YouTube, uh, we can use YouTube as a kind of shortcut for looking at what's happening with video online. Of course, YouTube's only one place that video is happening online. There's video on many uh, different sites, on organizational sites, on news media sites, on lots of places. But if we just look at YouTube as one place, we can get a sense of the scale of video online, uh, and, and we can also get a sense of how much time people are spending watching rather than reading. So the scale is incredible. Every minute, 72 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube. That's just an incredible number. It was 48 hours last year, and two years ago it was 24 hours. So it's accelerating rapidly, just the amount of content that people are creating, sharing, watching is incredible. Four billion views a day. Um, uh, and, and I think the most important statistic on this slide that you're seeing is that the average user, the average internet user, uh, is spending 15 to 25 minutes every day on YouTube. And if any of you are the ones who look at your Google Analytics, the, anal the, the analysis of your own website, you know that the average time spent on your site is probably in the one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute. And if it gets to five minutes, you get very excited. But sites that are heavy in video are finding deeper engagement because people are watching more video. So, um, you know, when we, when we look at uh, the, the numbers again, uh, we can see that these video numbers are really extraordinary and and they're really broad based you know when we started doing this work and thinking about online video um, it was a youth business it was a it was something that only the young people were doing and today when we in particular look at a donor population uh, in particular we can pretty much uh, say that there's universally people are watching video online and this is true really across age groups and it's it's remarkable how that demographic distribution has flattened out over the years and really become something that is nearly as broad based as television certainly um, in the in the what what I would call the donor countries you know those places where uh, when we're thinking about fundraising um, the populations that we're trying to reach Uh, so, you know, there's, there's videos that we've seen. This is the a video from, uh, from, actually comes from the Nike Foundation called The Girl Effect. If you haven't seen this, this is something you should go onto uh, online and just type in The Girl Effect and, and you'll see it. 
but it's a it's a way to take complicated issues and using something like motion graphics in this case create something really compelling. Um, and so we're seeing video uh, occasionally uh, certain videos just pop out of the pack. Uh, and a great example of that last year was the Coney 2012 video. And so regardless of what you think about their theory of change or the organization or how they work, um, the fact is they got 150 million people to watch 30 minutes of video. The, the video is 29 minutes long, um, and it was the most watched nonprofit or NGO video ever made. Um, and it's really remarkable in the fact that it tells the story um, of someone and their ability to change the world. And I think that's another thing. Mike's going to talk a little bit about this, but about the idea of the, the role of the donor of being a hero, the donor being at the center of the story. Um, and so these are, these are things that have broken through the noise of the general culture, but not everything has to be at this level, at this, this viral thing that takes off. There are audiences, critical audiences, that each of our organizations have that we can attract through serial storytelling. Mike, I'm going to let Michael. you uh, take it from here and, and uh, start to talk to us about what serial storytelling is. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, now, here's an overview of what I'll be covering. What is serial storytelling? Why viewers will want to join you in that journey? How serial storytelling works and ways you can use it to get more out of social media. Now, first of what? Now, serial storytelling is human stories told in episodes. It's a uniquely effective way to engage viewers. You give them common human feelings they can value. You make heroes out of your viewers. Heroes out of your viewers. I'll go into that more in detail. You make them hungry for more videos and you relieve donor fatigue. So, let's get down to some explanations. Serial storytelling has been a huge success since prehistoric times with storytellers traveling from village to village telling the latest human dramas that have been unfolding in other villages. And it's also something that we do over the proverbial backyard fence these days, which is more likely to be a coffee shop, social media site, or email, where you hear or tell the latest installments, the latest installments or episodes of real life dramas. We know that millions of viewers, viewers both in TV and in web audiences, watch serial dramas each week. What will happen next to Brody and Carrie or the star characters of other popular serial shows? The public, your potential supporters, they are primed for serials. The storytelling is right at the intersection of social media highway and the content upramp, where all of that social media web traffic with this desire for real life narratives and updates comes together like a magnet with video content that can satisfy that relentless river of web traffic. So those four features of serial storytelling, deeply rooted in human history, our backyard fence love of news, our modern day loyalty to serial TV and web dramas, and our exploding use of social media, all of those reinforce the value of serial storytelling for nonprofits. Okay, now why? Serial storytelling makes sense for nonprofits. NGOs and good causes already have natural serial dramas to tell. If you're trying to protect people from abuses, poverty, poor education, starvation, or other crises, whether it's in a Western city or an Afghan village, you have true life serial drama. For example, nonprofit workers whose daily struggles and triumphs make your mission work and the individuals you are helping also have life stories that lend themselves to serial storytelling. The Bridge, my second reason why serial storytelling is a great mission asset for nonprofits. It provides the bridge for the viewer and the donor to make that journey, to get them from their world into your world where they become the hero of your mission story. Here's how serial storytelling works as a bridge. First of all, episodes. 
when you tell your story in episodes, you convey real-life mystery and suspense, which give viewers and donors something to look forward to, to want to cross that bridge. Next is empathy. Empathy, empathy becomes easier because as serial episodes unfold, the viewer sees repeated examples, repeated examples of common human values like love and family and self-respect. Now, the viewer and the donor as a hero. This is very important. The viewer and the donor feel like heroes of your serial stories because they see the evidence of how their support makes a difference in the lives of individuals in your stories. Leverage. You can leverage the rest of your campaign with serial storytelling. By that I mean that inside your serial story videos you can include information about other important aspects of your mission. You can use your videos to direct viewers to multiple parts of your website. Leveraging. Donor loyalty. Because of the repetitive exposure to missions through, through your, to your mission through serial storytelling and because you have cast the donor as your main heroic figure by virtue of his or her receiving true value through serial stories, you're more likely to have their loyalty when you need it. Viral triggers. I want to expand on that for a moment. Viral triggers, as I mentioned earlier, are elements of stories that make viewers want to share those videos with others on the web and you can embed them into your true life stories because they occur naturally. Here are 10 viral triggers. Suspense, mystery over what will happen in the next episode, dignity, the dignity of individuals in your stories who face hardship with courage and endurance, empathy, the feeling that understanding the common humanity of this person that you're identifying with and the human qualities they have in your stories. Ownership. The feeling that the viewer, that she, he or she has invested in the story of your individuals. If you own it, you might want to share it. Share that fact with others on the web. Outrage. Outrage over the plight of people the NGO is trying to help. Outraged viewers are likely to want to share that sense of injustice with others on the web. Surprise. When the unexpected happens in the course of a serial episode, it can be tempting to share. Humor. People in bad places sometimes use humor or irony in order to counteract, to cope, maybe even survive terrible times. When humor rises up and is used sensitive, sensitively, it helps viewers to stay with you through heavy times and to share your stories with others. Uniqueness. It can be any number of things that are out of the ordinary and worth sharing with other web users. New. Episodes that have new developments, new twists and turns are worth sharing. Worthy. And viral triggers number 10 is worthy. When viewers feel that a video reflects worthiness they're likely to want to share that story, that feeling of worthiness. Compassion fatigue. That's the next reason why serial storytelling is a great mission asset, the relief of compassion fatigue. Serial stories do not ha hide bad news, but when you can actually repeatedly see in episode after episode the daily humanity among people in need, you don't feel that you're being bombarded with only misery. Compassion becomes easier. Pushing against an open door. Social media audiences are primed for this approach. Here's Michael with more. Yeah, so one of the things that this serial storytelling can can address is this sense of a glut of content. I mean, we're, you know, those statistics that I showed earlier about how much video is uploaded to YouTube um, just shows the environment that we're working in and living in is an environment full of media. Um, and the need to keep people connected and involved um, is critical. So people have come to expect the next thing. And often with our organizations, they don't get that. They get one-offs, and there's no expectation of follow-up or of the next 
installment, the next episode, the next part of the story. Um, and so this is something that organizations um, need to begin to do in order to not only attract that audience, but retain that audience. Because the cost of attracting that audience over and over again is simply too high. So, and as Mike was saying, um, the serial storytelling becomes a great mission asset because the, the dramas are already there. We're not reinventing anything that's not already happening. Um, and, you know, these are a bridge from the donor, from people who often can't see what's going on to what's going on. Um, and uh, as Mike talked about, the idea of creating that donor loyalty, of really understanding um, what's happening on the ground. You know, one of the things that we do very well in organizations is solicit people for gifts. One of the things we don't do very well is show them what's happening with the resources that they've provided. Serial storytelling is a way to do that, and I believe a way to keep uh, donors much more engaged, much more likely to become monthly givers, for example, than single gift givers, which is a key thing that many organizations are trying to do. Uh, and certainly there's, there's a lot of other things competing for people's attention, and that kind of compassion fatigue, which again, it's always at the beginning of, the, of that funnel of that uh, there's an urgent need as opposed to pulling people through the story. And then the last point uh, is that social media and the world that we live in today is inviting this kind of continued engagement. And so we are pushing against an open door to, uh, uh, in terms of using serial storytelling and how they can work through all these mediums that we're trying to use effectively, like Facebook, for example. So let's go a little bit deeper here and talk about how does this actually work? How do we make this happen? So Mike, why don't you take it back and, and walk us through that? Thank you, Michael. Now, this is going to be my version of the webisode model. Now, you may have your own uh, out there in whatever nonprofit you're with. And that may work just fine. Uh, so by all means, use what works for you. But here's how I would explain it. Each single webisode or video episode is a complete real-life story, a three-act drama with a beginning, a middle, and an end. In the beginning of each video episode, a crisis arises. In the middle, action ensues. And resolution of some kind is established at the end. That resolution, by the way, sets up a new status quo, which is the basis for the next episode. So if, for instance, there are six video episodes in your series, you will have a half dozen individual three-part videos, each connected to another like a chain reaction. Or to put it another way, every video you do is going to have to be done in three parts. So. Building your serial stories, and by the way, if you feel more comfortable calling them three parts or three sections instead of three acts, that's just as valid. We're not trying to make theater out of serious issues and circumstances. How you label the parts of your story is certainly up to you. Cast of characters. Cast of characters. By that I mean real-life individuals through whom we will experience the serial story of your nonprofit mission. The first member of your cast is the narrator or storyteller. If you're not using a professional storyteller, your next best bet might be one of your own staff members as narrator. Next, the good guys. These are the people through live, whose lives the viewer will experience the serial story of this mission. It might be your nonprofit staff, or it might be some of the individuals your mission is helping. The good guys are the heroes of your story. And you'll need bad guys for bad things, real life evil, so to speak. Bad things happen, of course, and that's why your nonprofit is out there to overcome them. Without bad things or bad people in your stories, there can be no struggle, no suspense, and no momentum to your serial story. But you won't have any trouble finding these. As we've said before, they're there. They're just part of life, and you're part of you're part of the universe. In your own case, bad guys might be warlords uh, who created a refugee crisis, 
or bad things, which might be various misfortunes of war, poverty, human rights abuse, economic oppression, etc. For this mock-up serial episode, let me call this nonprofit mission the Help Organization. Let's say it's supplying, supplying food, shelter, and health care to war victims in a troubled region of the world. The Help Organization has a staff of 15 people at a refugee camp looking after tens of thousands of refugees from a neighboring war-torn country. And remember, your own serial stories will be filmed as they happen, not faked or staged. Now, I've composed this example out of my experience of reporting over several decades in places like these. So these are based in reality. Okay, the good guys. In our mock-up episode, our good guys are Jane, a nonprofit staff worker for the HELP organization, and a woman refugee named Nabila. They are composites of many people I've met in similar circumstances. And our other good guy is the viewer, or donor, who will be the main hero, as we'll see as we go on. Act 1, or Part 1, the beginning. Remember, there will be a beginning, middle, and an end in every episode. The beginning is when the status quo is disrupted, and when a new crisis begins. So, we open with filming Jane, the help organization staff worker, as she starts her workday. She tells us about the nonprofit mission. And then our cameras come upon Nabila, a 23-year-old war refugee and mother of three children, who tells us about her troubled life. Her current challenge is to find food and shelter in the increasingly crowded camp. This is the starting point, the status quo. Then, still in the beginning here, in the first act, so to speak, a new situation erupts the status quo. We see that Jane is jolted by the news of more refugees surging across the border and will be swamping the camp within 24 hours. Jane says she doesn't know what will happen if the refugees keep coming and the food keeps running out. And yet another disruption of the status quo occurs. Nabila's daughter becomes sick. The refugee mother tells us that her youngest 18 months old daughter is running a very high fever. Now we have a full-blown situational crisis and two personal stories within that crisis. And we're still less than two minutes into our episode. Plus, there are embedded viral triggers here of danger, and suspense to help keep viewers' attention. Now, the viewer is included in the story at this point, right at the very beginning, because the narrator tells him or her that Jane not even, cannot even begin to face these problems without viewer support, and that Nabila and many other refugees, their survival is in the hands of viewers who support the mission. That is the end of part one. There's no commercial break. The video just keeps rolling, but what you've done in this first section, this beginning of this single episode, in less than two minutes perhaps, is to establish a classic true life narrative structure. In this case, three individual storylines running parallel, the nonprofit worker, the refugee, and the viewer who can make a difference, all running within the larger story of your nonprofit mission. Now to the middle. Jane is filmed going to the office and briefing the staff on the overwhelming overcrowding and the food crisis she's seen. They fire off emails to headquarters asking for urgent help. They reduce rations in the camp in order to spread the food further. When the new refugees arrive, it's a race against time. It's a struggle, a struggle in this middle section. We also see that Nabila has walked nearly a mile with all of her children to a clinic in hopes that her sick daughter will be seen by a camp doctor. Her baby is alive but unconscious, and we don't yet know what the doctor will say. It's hot and they're all tired and weak. The child's future hangs in the balance. Nabila's struggling. The third good guy, the viewer, is told that supporter donations built this clinic, built this clinic where Nabila's child will be treated. The viewer is also told that more clinics and more medical staff are needed and that, the, and that only the viewer or viewers like this person can make that happen. Thus, the viewer has a tangible role at this point and a decision to make for the future survival of the camp and people like Nabila's family. Part 3, 
the climax and a new status quo is established. Nabila's child is seen by the doctor and given medicine for an infection. The child will live thanks to the fact that supporters built and staffed the clinic. Nabila, who has shown viewers the compassion and determination of a devoted mother under stress, walks back to her tent where she and her children virtually, virtually collapse from one day's ordeal, just one day. We are now increasingly invested in Nabila's story. We are emotionally, in, emotionally involved in the crisis of this woman who displays virtues we admire and whose child has just been saved by the help organization doctor. Jane, meanwhile, has managed to provide food today to the current population, but just for today. And Nabila has, she and Nabila have fought and won today, just barely. Then two things happen near the end of this climax, or Act 3. There's another crisis looming. Jane learns that an aid convoy due to arrive this week has been delayed indefinitely. And Nabila says she's learned that her husband, Hasim, has been lost behind enemy lines but and presumed dead, but has been seen this side of the border and is wounded. She tells us she's going to rescue him. It will be a four-day round-trip journey on foot. She will have to leave her children behind. Thus, a new status quo is established, or a new crisis, which carries with it suspense. Although this crisis is a mock-up, remember that these kind of situations and developments do arise in crises and conflict zones and in other good cause environments. Your own stories will document what is actually happening with your mission. Serial storytelling for nonprofits is the process of documenting the reality of your mission and framing it in true life stories that enable audiences to understand and support your mission. Serial storytelling is the facts with soul. Now in the final 15 seconds of Act 3, or third section, we tease forward to the next video episode tomorrow or next week. What will happen to Nabila and her family as she sets out in search of her husband? What will happen to Jane's delayed aid convoy? Will the viewer continue to fight alongside Jane and Nabila with the powerful weapon of his or her donation? And will the viewer join the battle to help keep this series going viral? There is uncertainty ahead with much at stake. We will find out more in episode two tomorrow or next week or whenever we post the next three videos in this series. So, what just happened? We filmed a three-act or three-part real-life drama that lasted, say, only six minutes. We've given viewers an unfolding story of individual characters with whom they can bond and travel with alongside in this journey. Our mission has been explained and illustrated. We've given viewers a compelling case for their support. We've embedded the viral triggers of emotional connection, empathy, danger, and suspense. We have teased ahead with a quick preview of the next episode. That is how serial storytelling works. It is the story of lives told the way we are wired to receive it, in ups and downs, one act after another, with the suspense of what will happen next to people we care about. Now, as for the third good guy, the viewer, and hopefully donor, what have we done for him or her? We have tapped into their best values. For instance, if you were a parent, you will find empathy for Nabila as she tries desperately to hold her family together. Thus, the series is also about the feelings of the viewer who identifies with Nabila, her parental instinct, her bravery, her persistence, and her need for support. The viewer can also identify with the mission worker Jane as she tries to overcome logistical nightmares. Who among us cannot identify with the feeling of being overwhelmed by circumstances beyond our control? And the viewer learns how they can be the most important part of the team effort, the main hero, by taking action. And we've given our donor another ta tangible role in this video or challenge and that's to share the video with their friends. So the series continues. Every serial storytelling episode, or series rather, should be at least two episodes. There can be as many more as you think will survive a narrative. Each new episode begins with a few seconds of 
previously in this series, which reminds people of the situation so it can be seen on its own. Then there, it's right into a brand new three-part or three-act episode, which continues the true life struggles of our good guys against bad things. Michael. Great. Thank you, Mike. I, I want to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what do we do with these stories in order to get them in front of the people that will, that will matter for us. Um, because the best content that we could create um, is, is only valuable to us if we know how to use it, how to deploy it, how to get people uh, engaged in it, uh, get people to share it, um, and, you know, make the most of it. So I think the most important um, first thing is your own constituents are the core, are the centerpiece of your distribution strategy, existing constituents. Um, and so it starts with your own website and making that uh, channel. So if you're going to invest in a story like this, then you need to create the framework on your own web pages to display that story. And the, the nice thing about your own web pages, as opposed to, let's say, YouTube, is you can give context to this story um, on that on those pages. You can um, have additional information. People can dig deeper. People can donate. Um, and there's things that, that all of the things that you want to share, uh, you can include in that space. The other thing we have to think about is email. Um, email is the way people don't just stumble upon organizational websites. They're usually pulled back there. Email is still the primary way that that happens. Uh, though we see social media um, intruding on that somewhat. But one of the things we've seen, and, and you know, results vary depending on, on the type and organization, but um, the promise of watching video often boosts email response. So when people see that they can uh, see this story, they can click on this, on this video uh, in their email and it'll take them to watch this video, um, it'll boost the open rates and the click-through rates uh, of email. Again, it's not your results may vary, but uh, we've seen this consistently across different kinds of organizations at different levels. The other thing um, to think about is your channels that you have connections with online, so including uh, all of your social media. One way to tie all of that together is to use a hashtag. A hashtag allows for conversations to happen off of your channel on, on a site like Twitter or on Facebook but for people to be able to follow that conversation um, uh, even though it's happening in different places. So creating, for example, Pinterest uh, boards around the characters or the stories, um, a YouTube playlist that has links. You can also add additional videos to those playlists that give more in-depth about certain aspects of the story that people, if they want to dig deeper can do. It's like that bonus content that we're seeing a lot now with uh, TV series and, and news programs. You can, you know, go online to see the full interview, for example, those kinds of things. Um, uh, outtakes, other kinds of things you can do in those playlists. Um, and the other thing you can do is, uh, you know, using Facebook, you can do things like live streaming. So there's certain things you can do, either some of what's happening related to that episode or you can create additional content around that saying, you know, as you're watching this story play out, some of the experts on our side are going to be available for questions. Uh, and you can do that as something using Google Hangout or live streaming on Facebook. You can create those moments where you allow your constituents, your donors, uh, potential donors to be part of that conversation, to give feedback uh, and to, to be connected to it. There's another thing that, that uh, you can do with serial stories that doesn't really work with the one-off videos, and that is that these, as compelling stories, we know that news organizations and media organizations are interested in quality stories. They're always looking for, for quality stories uh, here, uh, and we're seeing an explosion of new news outlets, things like Huffington Post and the like. They're all desperate for good content. So I'm going to let Mike, who has been in the news business for most of his career, to talk a little bit about how we could take these serial stories 
and make it work for these news outlets to get us in front of many more people. Thank you, Michael. I, I think I would just think like a newsroom, if that's possible. Now, here are 13 things or keys that audiences, audience-hungry news executives love. New, compelling, exciting, emotional, dangerous, weird, momentous, exclusive, viral, local angle, cheap, and the mother of them all, free. And we could talk forever about these, and, and I've been, I was tempted, but I'm just going to mention them. Now remember, you probably have a lot of these great key elements already. We've included some of them in our six-minute mock-up episode a few minutes ago. As for local angles for TV stations, if you have staffers from large western cities, you already have a local angle to offer. Now, there are never any guarantees, I can assure you from inside a newsroom, uh, but if you offer high-quality, high-end, legitimate journalism that adds value content for news organizations free of charge, you're on the right track. And I know that a lot of you are already doing that, and that's good news. Michael? Yeah, and one of the great things is that you know, with this content, you can um, make some adjustments to it for different audiences. If the news uh, media wants that content in a slightly different format or without uh, some of your narration so they can do their own, those are very easy and, and inexpensive ways to take the same content and reuse and repurpose it. So I just want to talk a little bit about, and, we're, uh, and then we can go into questions, um, about some additional distribution points that are important. One of the things that uh, YouTube has been offering is different features for uh, NGOs to, to use that aren't necessarily available to every other uh, folks on YouTube. So if you're not, if you don't know about YouTube's nonprofit program uh, and you're not in it, you should be looking into that. Uh, it's available for organizations today in the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, and they're adding other countries um, soon um, uh, in the next few months as well. Um, and what they do, one of the things they do is allow you to have uh, overlays and annotations inside videos. So you can have clickable links inside the videos that you're producing that go on YouTube. And those links can be donation links, but those links can also be to additional information, to other videos. If you're watching videos on YouTube, you've probably seen this. At the end of the video, there's a box that says, watch this next video, and you can click on it. That's something that works in this serial storytelling way. Go to the next episode. And what that does is it, it allows this material to be quite evergreen in the sense that people can come into those first episodes long after the entire series has been created. The other thing you can do is um, use a tool like TubeMogul, which is a free, uh, has a free service that allows you to upload in one place and distribute to lots of other places. So for example, you can upload video to YouTube and Facebook and other video sharing sites um, all at the same time through this one uh, a channel, as well as to then aggregate statistics that come from that channel. Um, and the other thing is you can use uh, things like there's a widget, uh, widget which is a little technical uh, embeddable box from a company called Call to Action, and, and there are others that allow you to take your video and surround it with action items. So more information, a sign up, donation form, right in that widget, which then, for example, a blogger can embed on their website. So it's not only carrying the video, which is what people do when they embed your video, but it's carrying the entire campaign along with it. So you really have to think through what are you going to do to distribute this content and, and that conversation should be happening at the same time as you're deciding to do it in the first place. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It should really be um, core to the whole plan that you have for your content. So that that's the end of our um, prepared remarks um, and uh, we are here, uh, Mike, Mike Lee, who's taking his many years of experience in the field and in creating compelling media for the masses um, and uh, putting that skills and experience to work for nonprofits. And us at C3 are always working on these things and looking for these new techniques, understanding where the world's going. 
Um, and so, uh, Mike, I don't know if there's anything you want to close with, but we, I think we have some questions. I, th I think I'll go ahead and let the questions come. Okay, we're going to um, have our first question. Uh, the question is, yeah. uh, do you agree that companies in the sports and non-profit space, students, music halls, galleries, and et cetera, do in fact have when the mission is to leverage the economic value? Of so our first question is really about um, arts organizations, so very different than than the type of example that Mike gave. Um, how can an arts organization create this kind of serial storytelling um, when it's not when it's not obvious who the bad guys are, and how to create that suspense? Mike, do you want to you want to take that? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, th I think I would have to know the specifics, but I think it's quite possible. Um, the, there is adventure in everything. The arts certainly would lend themselves to serial storytelling. If I knew the specifics of what they were up to, it wouldn't have to be evil. It would have to be something you could fit into the story that moves it along. Uh, and, and less Yeah, I would say just I think that evil might not be the right uh, way to think about it. I think it's really about adversity. You know, what's the adversity? So the, 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 the dancer coming back from a broken leg or, the, or even, even related to, to funding or opening a new facility, those are all kinds of things that, that involve adversity. Um, and that adversity becomes that opposing force that you're trying to overcome. Uh, can I just add uh, and, and yeah. support what Michael has said? Uh, in an arts, organ arts organization, for example, the very fact that we are going behind the curtain, we're going behind the scenes, that is fascinating. Just the day-to-day -day operations of something like that, even if nothing went wrong, but something always goes wrong, that is fascinating and would certainly lend itself to serial storytelling. Um, the next the next question is um, about affiliates and about having affiliates in different countries and how do you um, work with them to have media assets um, being shared across these different affiliates if I, if I have that that question correctly um, uh, you know that that's an interesting issue I think one of the things that we've found as a challenge often is that the people who are closest to the stories, to the interest, the really interesting stories, aren't, don't necessarily have the jobs of being the storytellers, right? Often the, the storytellers are the folks who are sitting um, in the home office somewhere in the communications department, um, and they're a step or two or three removed from some of those things happening on the ground, um, as well as um, uh, and, and so there are challenges really in lining all of that up. And I think that you know one of the things that w that we think about when we when we talk about um, uh, with organizations that are spread out like that is the idea that everyone needs to be storytellers. Everyone needs to be identifying those things that are happening on the ground. And then we need to figure out ways that we can capture those stories um, in different places um, and share them. I agree, Michael. I think the closest, you, the closer you can get to where it's happening, the more authentic it's going to be. After that, the job of putting it together in narratives becomes much easier. That's great. And uh, another question is about, um, the last question that we have is about how do we work with people in the field to get those those stories. Um, uh, so how do we uh, work with those people who it's not necessarily, it's not their job uh, to get those stories, and how do we work with the subjects in the field and make it um, uh, okay to be telling their stories? Uh, Mike, can you talk a little bit about that, about how you, um, going in as an outsider, uh, you know, are able to build the trust or make those connections to be able to do that? 
Absolutely. And I would say to the questioner, do not worry. It is something that can be done. I love to do that sort of thing because what I found over and over again that people who don't think they are good storytellers or public personas, just their natural dramas and talking about it forms the core of a great serial story. It is not, it's almost never a problem to talk to people on the scene to, to get them to talk about themselves and what they're going through and then you put that together into a narrative. They don't have to be producers, you know, others like us can do things like that. But as I said before, if you get there on the scene, I've never been in a place that I didn't think there were stories that I had to leave behind. And I've never ever seen a place that didn't have a story with the, the natural elements of people who were there who didn't think that there were storytellers. And there's another um, uh, thing that we've seen, which is that people in the field whose job is to provide services, let's say, don't, don't see this, this as their job. And they might see that as intrusive in some way to the work that they're doing. And one of the ways that we've overcome that, um, uh, one is to make them partners in, in this uh, effort and to understand the connection between exposing the stories and the work that they're doing uh, with the fact that that's where resources come from. And we've seen this a few times where those who are reluctant to be within an organization, who are reluctant to be involved in it, when they saw the impact of it and they saw that the work that they're doing get getting a lot of attention, it creates a positive feedback loop that makes others in the organization want to find those stories and want to be involved in it. A lot of this sometimes, I was just going to say, sometimes this can be done by giving briefings to people on the scene from a distance. Sometimes you have to be on the scene. It depends on the individual circumstance. Mike, we have a question that I think you're, you, you can answer well, which is we don't always have the ability to stay with a subject over a long period of time. Let's say we only have one day of production uh, in somebody's life. How can we use these techniques in that situation? How can we create that narrative um, even though we're not going to have our subject um, you know, in any significantly long period? Well, you just keep looking for repetitive three-act scenarios in, in anybody. I don't know about you, but in my day, I think I have a lot of dramas, and probably uh, they, they may not be earth-shaking, but if, if you follow somebody for a day and learn how to look for it, you will find a beginning, middle, and an end to everyone's day, and then you can put that into a narrative that relates to your mission. You can do it in a day. Uh, you may not do it if they're sitting on a bench and doing nothing else, but uh, if they are interacting with the mission or if they are part of the mission in some obvious way, it can probably be done. Now, I, if you're talking about crew, crew cost and things like that, um, we have overweight, you know, we have ways of putting one person on the ground, uh, which alleviates that to a certain degree. But I do right. understand what the question implies, and I've, I've been in the same situation where I had to crash in for a day and go out again, and I didn't feel like I came back with much. But you can, if you look for it, you can more likely than not come back with something. Right, and I think another uh, approach there is also you can tell some of the story that happened in the past and then join that person in the present. So if they were uh, in a terrible situation and they're better now, um, there is a way to using, you know, editing and uh, telling stories. Often, if there's availability of photographs, you can then create that backstory um, as without needing more time to follow them. That's right, Michael. And and if you you only have to look at some TV documentaries to see that uh, that's done with a beginning, middle, and an end, where the person in the present day starts telling the story that starts, say, years ago. And they build a narrative of beginning, middle, and end with one interview, and that certainly is possible. Mm -hmm. Mike, we have another question, really, about the news business. And you know, if 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 a news station likes the story that you have, but what they really want is B-roll and other material so they can do their own uh, piece around it. How do you make sure that the pieces that you care about, the interview that you care about, the kinds of uh, piece that relates to your organization, get in there in the end? and not just the, the, the other parts of it. 
several ways to go about that. Uh, if uh, this is the old B rolls uh, problem, and uh, I've been on the taking end of that for many, many years, where we would take uh, B roll that would, might be given to us by a nonprofit and use it in ways that were probably shamelessly irresponsible. Uh, it may be even to do with a diff totally different story. Uh, ways around that include uh, offering a station a package where they can top and tail it. Uh, you can, if they, if they really like the video, you can also uh, sign a temporary licensing, licensing agreement with them um, once, the, once they do like it. I mean, you, you do have some leverage in that way that you can use in a gentle way where stations uh, can use that. Because, again, it's not just on air anymore. It is web, and they're looking for a huge amount of material. Uh, I would be quite reluctant to give away any B-roll anymore these days because it's quite likely more times than not to end up uh, in a use that you don't want it. But there are ways, and I would have to know the specifics of each circumstance, there are ways to, to get around that to a large degree so and try it, to leverage it, it, what you it, want to do. It sounds like, Mike, I mean, that you don't just do whatever they tell you to do. It's a negotiation that you, yes, that yes. in a way, you, you, have, you don't you just have more leverage than you think you might. Yes. Right. It right. used to be, it's right. changed, Michael. It used to be that the networks, basically, which I was involved in, were the gatekeepers, the three linear gatekeepers. Now the game has changed. Uh, people are reaching out to all sorts of different uh, sources, and free material has become more important than ever, and it's free and not cheesy. Well, if it's free and cheesy, they might use it anyway, but if it's free and good quality, uh, then, you know, they want it. You have a, you have a right and probably a duty in a way to make sure that your message gets into that. And that could be done without getting, it could be done without upsetting the news organization. Uh, so, we have again, a question about, um, uh, we have a question about releases and, and permissions. Um, you know, one of the things that we always do when we shoot um, is have uh, short releases available for signature, if we're in, a, in a, another country, those releases should be in a native language. Um, but we've also, um, in the field, um, uh, getting an on-camera release uh, can be a, a substitute uh, if, if you don't have the availability um, to get that. So somebody basically giving their permission to be filmed uh, on film um, uh, is a substitute. And what we've seen is, depending on the organization and its size and its attorneys, um, uh, you know, there's different uh, sense of, of how strict uh, folks are, how comfortable they are, uh, you know, with those different formats. But I think, you know, absolutely, um, uh, you know, having those releases uh, prepared and ready, that's part of your kit. Uh, when you're going when you're going out into the field, and that's I think a little bit different than the news business. It is different than the news business because when you know we would just go and shoot people. Uh, sometimes I would get a video release, but uh, in this in the nonprofit world, I certainly would favor a video release because I mean if you're in a refugee camp, for example, and some uh, woman who doesn't understand uh, couldn't write and couldn't even in the native language might not be able to read. Uh, what's going on, even if we're read to them. It, it, it needs to be read to them and make sure they understand it. And if you do that on video and you hear the person explaining it and the individual consenting to it, then it's more clear. So I think shoving legal documents in front of everyone is not necessarily the right thing to do. Right, right. So our last question, we're running out of time here, and we have one last question, which is related to that B-roll question. It was a question about um, showing destruction in the Ivory Coast. If you sh if you show something and it and it uh, has a destruction that's caused by the army, um, and you really want to talk about how this affected people, how do you how does it not just get that, dis that those images used without the context that you're trying to provide um, with it? And I think that that really is uh, you know Mike really answered that earlier in the sense that. Um, you're not necessarily giving up just that footage. And so, you know, in, the, in those cases, I think if you believe that your B-roll, that your footage could be used in a way that you don't want it to be used, then you shouldn't be handing it over in, the way, in that way. It should only come with, 
the context that you want it to come with. And that might mean that it's not going to get on that same news program. It might mean that you have to go to a Huffington Post or some new outlet that's willing to take your story um, as you're telling it. So I agree. I, I would be a little bit more blunt myself. For many decades, we in the news media were the bullies. We would, uh, and nonprofits would be afraid not to help us because they might not get exposure. But now you don't have to worry about that. There are other avenues for exposure. And if you're a nonprofit and you think it might get misused or the, or the news organization refused to sign uh, a, a licensing agreement, a simple form that says that they will run this as it is and as a story, uh, then walk away. Just walk away uh, because you now have other options. Right. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you, Mike, for, for uh, participating in this uh, today. And um, it's just been really terrific um, to hear about how we can use these, these techniques that have been around for a long time that are being used by media companies and put them into the nonprofit world. So thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any additional questions, we will follow up if we weren't able to get to them. Um, you've seen our contact information, and if there's anything you want to follow up with us, um, you should be happy to. And we this, re this webinar has been recorded, and each of you will get an email with a link to that recording so that you can share that with colleagues um, or uh, go back to it. So again, thank you very much, and have a great rest of your day.